there could be a real problem there because if the hotel industry is going to get back on its feet and it's going to take it two years, three years to do it, they're going to have to cut some costs. And some of those costs have got to be employment costs. And what is sad is that governance improved in the private sector considerably. Now, obviously, there's still stuff to do, and sometimes it, it doesn't work as well as it should. But in the public sector, it went in the other direction. Uh, political parties should uh, have accounts. You know, they're the only people in Mauritius who don't need to produce accounts. Companies have to produce accounts, and you know, you, as you probably know, you've got an account every year that you have to submit in a way to the MRA. And what has to happen is you've got to take the pension out of the political domain. The, both political parties have to say, we're not going to use the pension to get votes. <music> Thank you for accepting uh, of a business invitation. Uh, the government has been very critical of the private sector recently. What do you think of this alone against all approach adopted by, by them? The economic situation of Mauritius is frankly dire. Not that we're seeing the consequences yet. Those, I think, come next year, whether it's in June, July, October, don't know. Not in the first quarter, but from the second, second quarter onwards, I think we're going to see some fairly dire stuff. And the private sector, um, you know, there are people that will not survive. So it's very difficult to ask, you know, they say we've got to reinvent the tourist industry, we've got to reinvent that, we've got to do things differently. That's wonderful to say, but you know, when you're drowning, the first thing you want to do is save your life. Then you can have a look at whether your shirt's looking nice or your trousers and where you might want to go. So I think that is one of the problems that, that uh, and you know, uh, if you look at who is suffering and who will suffer, at the moment, the population, some of it's suffering, but most of them with the wage support scheme, etc., are not suffering. I think we've got enough foreign exchange to take us uh, into well into next year. So at the moment, you know, that we get the goods on the shelves. This Christmas is going to be as good as last Christmas, etc. Um, but the people that are really suffering, I mean, the hotel industry is really suffering. Uh, 25% of its uh, costs are being covered by the Wage Support Act, but the 75% that is not being supported, okay, they've got some local tourists, which is good, but you know, it's probably only 10% of the revenues they would normally get. So I think they are hurting, hurting very badly, and they're going to hurt some more. But do you think that, that the government is doing the right thing to protect businesses and jobs? You know, you've got to, uh, it's again, this, we're very special. Um, in America, they decided to protect incomes, not jobs. In the UK, they decided actually to protect jobs with the furlough scheme. Here, we've gone further than even in the UK, because in the UK, you were allowed to make people redundant without any real penalty. Here, if you're taking any kind of wage support scheme for your uh, the people you would not make redundant, you can't, you, you can't make people redundant. So uh, what government are doing here are protecting jobs. Now, I understand that, but if we look into the medium term, there could be a real problem there because if the hotel industry is going to get back on its feet and it's going to take it two years, three years to do it, they're going to have to cut some costs. And some of those costs have got to be employment costs. So, you know, I think we'd be 
better inspired to protect incomes, i.e. have a, a, a decent unemployment benefit, paid, I'm afraid, well, we'll, we'll pay for it in the end, of course, because the taxpayer pays, uh, rather than trying to make people employ people that they don't need and perhaps never get back on their feet. I think that's the danger we're facing at the moment. Tim Taylor, are you satisfied with the governance structure put in place within the new entity, the Mauritius Investment Corporation? We're slightly in the dark on the governance structure. If you, I think the MIC was a good thing, a very good thing. Okay, I, I think it's some of the things it says it would do is misguided. They say they're going to have a logistics hub in Africa. I don't really think that's what the MIC's job is. I think the MIC's job was to support some of the really important industries here in Mauritius, uh, so to, to, I say minimize, but to, yeah, to a degree lessen the COVID effect. And I think they're doing a good job in that field. You know, I, I see that Lux has agreed a loan and I, there's, there's another hotel group. Sun I, Resorts. Sun Resorts have agreed a loan and I understand negotiations are going on with the other hotel groups. Um, so I think that's good. Now, governance. Um, it's very difficult sitting on the outside looking in to know exactly how the governance works. You know, there's Lord Desai as the chairman, who is obviously not physically present in Mauritius. Uh, there's people on the board who are, uh, you know, respectable, competent people. Uh, but in the past, we have seen govern governance in parastatal bodies lacking, uh, lacking. Now, I think it's much too early to say whether it will lack in the MIC or not, and I hope it doesn't. I hope they do a good job. I hope the money goes to people, you know, they do a proper due diligence on whoever they lend the money to, and that the terms that they lend are for, reasonable for them and for the taxpayers whose money this is. But I think it's very difficult to say the MIC has got bad governance at, at the moment. We will see in time. Tim Taylor, you were the first chairperson of the National Committee on Corporate Governance. How do you explain the contrast that exists in the governance of private and public companies? Um, you know, when uh, yeah, I started this corporate governance role in 2001, in fact, there was a sort of pre-committee uh, 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 that was set up before that with Sushil Kushiram, who was Minister of Financial Services. And then when the National Committee was set up, I took the chairmanship and I was the chairman until, I think, 2015. Uh, Mr. Badan kicked me out in 2000. I think it was at the beginning of 2015. You know, we worked very very hard. Governance was, it had been, it's been around forever, but uh, let's say there was not that much emphasis on it if we look back to the beginning of this century. And we worked extremely hard with the private sector to improve the governance. And I think it has improved. Um, perhaps there's a little bit, perhaps we need to put a bit more pressure on again, I don't know. Uh, it, it looks slightly quieter at the moment, but I have no reason to believe that the, corp the governance committee doesn't work well. And I think they want to do the right things for corporate governance. Now, so the private sector actually responded positively, uh, very positively. Now, the public sector, we worked really hard with the public sector. Um, but, and you know, we came up with, uh, I mean, okay, the, what's the problem in the public sector? Uh, well, governance, how does governance work? It works if you have people of competence and integrity uh, on the boards of companies uh, and, you know, they are allowed to do their job without interference from a shareholder or from whoever. Now, in the public sector, in the parastatals, um, the uh, boards are nominated by the government, by the minister, and, of course, there's a temptation to nominate people. Well, in a way, it's quite normal. You want to no nominate people in whom you have confidence, people who are going to deliver the program that the government has set out, etc. Uh, so it's quite normal that they should want to put people who are positive to what their agenda is. The problem that we see is that sometimes people are appointed who don't have the competence uh, or perhaps the integrity uh, to actually carry out that 
those governance roles at the level of the parastatal boards. You know, we came up, if you look at how it's done elsewhere, Mauritius, you know, we are, of course, the center of the world, as you are aware of this, but there's things that happen elsewhere and we can learn about how, you know, what happens elsewhere. In Australia, for instance, in New Zealand, um, they have a, you know, if you want to be a, um, a, a director on a government board, you can make an application. You have to, uh, you have to fill in a form and you put your experience and et cetera, et cetera. You send it off to uh, this sort of governance center and this body sends it to the minister and the minister will choose from people who are willing to, and able and competent to serve uh, on that particular parastatal. Now, we did actually send all this to the government some years ago. I think it was Xavier Luc who was the Minister of Commerce and Industry at that stage. And we suggested... Well, we sent it to Zabelu because he was the minister. Was he minister finance. of finance? Yeah, yeah. He, he must be minister of finance. And um, needless to say, nothing happened. Um, <laughs> and the problem is that, yeah, they, they, are, they appoint people who don't, frankly, have the experience or the competence. And, that, and we are, I'm afraid we're there at the moment. And what's getting worse, you know, it used to be just at the level of the board, but now... Sometimes there is interference at the level of the executive as well, which is, frankly, even more serious. Uh, so, yes, we have got... And what is sad is that governance improved in the private sector cons considerably. Now, obviously, there's still stuff to do, and sometimes it, it doesn't work as well as it should. But in the public sector, it went in the other direction, which I think it's sad. It's sad for Mauritius, and I don't know... I'm not sure when it's going to change. Private companies, uh, notably those listed on the Mauritius Stock Exchange, publish the amount of donation to political parties. But the latter remain opaque as to the amounts received. Isn't that an anomaly that needs to be addressed, according to you? Yes, of course it is. You know, um, this was both the National Committee of Corporate Governance and the old JEC, if you remember, the forerunners of business precious, they made this recommendation to the private sector that any money given should be by cheque made to the name of the party, okay? And then it should be actually published in your accounts how much you gave. I can say, proudly say at the last election we gave nothing, but that's another, that's another matter. Now, obviously, if we're going to get a handle on, um, on financing of elections and of political parties, uh, political parties should uh, have accounts. You know, they're the only people in Mauritius who don't need to produce accounts. Companies have to produce accounts. And, you know, you, as you probably know, you've got an account every year that you have to submit in a way to the MRA. Uh, so we have this, frankly, it's uh, an anomaly that there you've got uh, the political parties with tons of money, lots of funds flowing in, etc. And they don't have, and in fact, I gather they're not even in a way constituted bodies. Uh, this is again an anomaly. So they don't have any accounts. So it, they, so there should be accounts. And in the accounts, it should say where the money came from and what you did with the money. I mean, that's how it works elsewhere. And that's frankly how um, it works in the private sector. And this is how we should progress with the political parties. But of course, um, everybody, no one's interested. Uh, well, no one appears to be interested to get it right. According to you, why does uh, good governance uh, matter for a little country like Mauritius? Um, you know, it doesn't matter how big or how little the country is. Governance basically ensures that uh, resources go to the right places. Uh, you know, with good governance, uh, let's take it on the national level, uh, it ensures that the taxes, you know, there's no, we mustn't kid ourselves, government hasn't got any money, it only has money which it takes from the taxpayers, whether it's the VAT, whether it's the income tax or the corporation tax, but there's a, the odd parastatal that might make a profit, but not many. Uh, 
you know, the, uh, the money comes from the purple. And I think governance matters because the PERP should be reassured that the money that they are actually contributing to the National Exchequer is, is managed and spent in a proper manner. So it's to ensure that the stakeholders who do not actually manage the money, but they own the resource behind, are not, uh, are not cheated. Uh, that's why governance is important. Maybe a final question. What is your outlook for 2021? Uh, you know, the biggest problem we have, well, not the biggest, one of the biggest problems we have at the moment is the pension scheme, our pensions. No one has got the political courage to actually say, you know, you, at the, the pension went up from 6,000 rupees a month to 9,000, and apparently in four years' time it goes to 13,500. Minimum wage is at 10,000. You can't possibly have your pension higher than the minimum wage. This is a total nonsense. And what has to happen is you've got to take the pension out of the political domain. The, both political parties have to say, we're not going to use the pension to get votes. And then you put up a technical committee to look to see how what the level of pension should be for whom and how do you fund it. Now, then the CSG can or cannot come in. You know, for instance, we here in Scott, everybody is on a pension scheme. Uh, we contribute, they contribute, and at the end of their, um, their career with us, and if they move in between, they can take the pension with them. They get a pension depending on the years of service and the, the, and the contributions that have been made. But most of the private sector do this now. Okay. And then you've got the uh, the MPF as well. So, you know, the, the people from Scott, they have three pensions. They have the the old age pension, they have the MPF, and they have the Scott pension. Now, we just need to understand uh, who's got what and what we need to do to make sure that the people, when they retire, have a decent pension. Um, but you, it cannot be a political football. It, it will ruin Mauritius. You know, you cannot have... We are in an amazing situation when retirement age now is 65, but you get your pension at 60. I mean... Come on, this isn't serious. Um, and of course, there's no political courage to sit down and sort the pension out. And that is going to be extremely, extremely grave for us in the future. Now, what else is extremely grave is the opening up of the economy or the lack of opening up of the economy. Um, we have to give Mr. Jagnat and his men, we give him... 10 out of 10 for keeping COVID out of Mauritius, okay? We, they did well. Wasn't always in agreement, but they did well. But, you know, COVID is around for the next two or three years. So there's no way we can be 100% sure of keeping COVID out. Now, we have something positive that has happened. We have the um, vaccine which has arrived or about to arrive. Um, now, how are we going to use that vaccine? Have they thought of it? Have they discussed? I mean, you know, we're in a very different position to France or the UK. UK today started vaccinating people and they've chosen to vaccinate people first, people over 80 years old. Why? Because there's a COVID all over the UK, so there's every chance an 80 year old could catch it and then he is, has a problem. Now, in Mauritius, it's not the case. There is no COVID today in Mauritius. The only COVID that's going to be in Mauritius is what comes in. So to my mind, what we should be doing is saying, firstly, if you want to come on a holiday in Mauritius, get a vaccine. So everyone who comes in is vaccinated, uh, which, you know, in the old days, you had to have a smallpox vaccine. Otherwise, you didn't get into Mauritius. I remember when I was a boy, uh, when I used to travel backwards and forwards to the UK, you had to have a small fax uh, a certificate. Now, I don't think, I, I think you'll find that most people who want to travel will be very well, happy, will be prepared to be vaccinated and have a certificate. So people coming in should have a certificate. Now, who could get it? It's actually the frontliners. Uh, who are the frontliners? It's people who work in hotels, it's taxi drivers, it's restaurants, it's uh, boat people. It's not 80-year-old people. You know, the average 80-year-old in, in, in Bobassin never meets a tourist. So, you know, but politically, it might be... Uh, 
they might think it's better to give to 80-year-olds. But if we've got a limited amount of vaccine, we should give it to the frontliners, and then we should say to people, the tourist industry, right, you can get on with it, you can bring people in, uh, tourists, providing they're vaccinated, and we will vaccinate your, your, your staff. Uh, now, I think we need to move on that quickly. Uh, it would be nice if that was working by Easter time. Now, as far as I can make out, I, we don't know what's happening. There's nothing clear coming out about what's being looked at, what the protocols are. We, you know, they've been talk talking about protocols to bring back tourists for the last six months, and absolutely nothing has come out. So, because I think it's everything that is proposed is kicked out by health people, by I don't know who. We're not sure who. Uh, the committee that runs Mauritius. Uh, so I think that is the most important thing that we're looking at at the moment. And I'm, I don't get the feeling this, it, it doesn't appear to be in that direction government is looking. And if we do not get the hotel industry working again, by October next year, we have major, major problems. Unemployment, no foreign exchange. You seem to be worried by the, by the future. For Mauritius. That's the case. Look, you know, um, we're a lucky country, but you know, in like, uh, I think it was it was Gary Player who um, who said he's someone said yeah, he's a golfer. And they said to him, um, oh, you know, you're you're really very lucky golfer. And he said, you know, the more I practice, the luckier I become. And that's what it is. Uh, yes, I am worried. I don't get the feeling that uh, the right things are being looked at. I don't get the feeling that we, we don't seem to want to accept how potentially desperate the situation is. And um, that is very worrying. Um, so yes, I am worried, but we're a lucky country. Hopefully we can get out of it. Hopefully they will actually suddenly come and say, hey, yes, we're going to change the way we're looking at things. Hopefully. Thank you, Tim Taylor. It's a pleasure.